Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us this evening. This is a very special evening. Well, I always say that, don't I? It's a very special evening. Well, it is indeed, because this piece that we're about to hear is, I'm quite sure this is its Canadian premiere. It may well be its North American premiere. It's always a little hard to tell. But that speaks to the fact that the operas of Francesco Cavalli are not very well known and I think they should be better known. And uh, it's been a great pleasure. The Toronto Consort has now done, over the last six or eight years, I guess, four different Cavalli operas, or this being the fourth. Some of you may have been at our other productions. We did uh, La Callisto, we did Giazzone, we did one called Gli Amori di Apollo e di Daphne, The Loves of Apollo and Daphne, and now tonight, The Helen of Troy, or Elena as it is called in Italian. And the fact that these pieces are so rarely done is because of a number of, of issues. In some ways it is a little surprising because Cavalli was very highly regarded in his own time. He was sort of discovered, if you will, as a boy. He lived um, not too far, but not right in Venice. He lived in Northern Italy and he was gifted with a very beautiful treble voice. And, as you know, the church was always on the lookout for beautiful boy singers because they usually took the soprano line in church music. And of course, there was a great musical establishment in nearby Venice, particularly at the most important church in Venice, San Marco. And it was there that he was invited to come as a boy as is often the case, he wasn't actually uh, of a very wealthy background, and he uh, had a patron, and in fact his patron's name was Cavalli. And he took his patron's name, that was also very common, that if you were kind of of no account, really, in your family background, and then a patron, or some kind of wealthy person, supported your endeavors, not just in music, but of whatever kind, as a sign of honor, you would almost, and, and that you became part of that family. So in fact, he was not born Cavalli, he was born Bruni, but he was, became Cavalli, and from then on his name was Francesco Cavalli, and that's how we know him today, of course, too. When he came um, to Venice in the early 17th century, the head of the music program at San Marco was none other than Claudio Monteverdi. And Monteverdi recognized very quickly this young boy's talent. And we are not, we don't have hard evidence, but it's quite clear from a couple of letters that Cavalli wrote later in his life. He talks about how much he was indebted to Monteverdi. And we suspect that he actually had music lessons, probably. That would have also been one of Monteverdi's responsibilities act as the head of the musical establishment at San Marco was to make sure that everyone was up to snuff and if it meant teaching music to a young boy, that was part of, probably part of his duties. So many biographers of Cavalli will say he was a student of Monteverdi's. The other thing that was happening at this time, which is important for tonight, was that, as you know, Monteverdi is considered in some ways the father, even almost the creator, of opera. There were a few attempts at or not attempts, there were a few operas before Monteverdi's wonderful Orfeo, um, which we're going to be doing on our program next year in concert, which was first produced in 1607. That was when Monteverdi was working for the Dukes of Mantua, and that's where the first performances of Orfeo took place. That was in a kind of courtly and academic situation. It was not a public event, if you will. But in 1637, in Venice, the first public opera house opened. It was not a theater that had been built for opera. It was not purpose-built, as we say. It was one of Venice's theaters, and there were quite a few theaters in Venice. But it was the first time that someone had rented the theater and decided, instead of putting on plays or comedies of any kind, decided to put on an opera. And that changed everything, really, in the history of opera, because instead of, as a situation with Monteverdi's Orfeo, or in, in the next year he wrote another opera, which was apparently an unbelievably beautiful opera called Arianna, 
which unfortunately we've lost most of. We don't have the music for it. Um, but instead of being for a courtly situation, this was now in a public house. There was someone who was in charge of the company who had rented the theater who was trying to, God save him, turn a buck <laughs> by producing opera. <laughs> <laughs> a big mistake. It's not easy to make money producing operas because it's such an expensive art form. But, um, and the reason it's expensive, of course, is because you have all sorts of singers. And even in those days, just like today, opera singers were very well paid. You also have to have orchestral accompan accompaniment of some kind. You sometimes have dancers. You certainly have to have s costumes, sets lighting designs of various kinds. It's a, it's a piece of theater. It's not just a piece of music anymore. And so with those kinds of pressures, um, it, the, way, the opera world changed quite a bit. But it was just at this time that Cavalli was growing up in Venice. And as some of you will know, Monteverdi, when the first opera, public opera houses opened in 1637, of course, he was very well regarded as a composer, and everyone knew he had written operas earlier in his lifetime. And there was a lot of people around Venice who said, when are you, Claudio Monteverdi, going to write us an opera? But by this time, he was 70. And he could easily have said, well, I think I'm just going to go into retirement and not keep writing music. But like some wonderful composers that keep writing no matter what their age, and have new ideas and inspirations all the time. Uh, Monteverdi joined the fray, as it were, and wrote two of his best known operas, The Return of Ulysses and The Coronation of Popea, for the public opera houses in Venice. So I have no doubt also, and I, uh, scholars have no doubt, that this also played a big part in Cavalli's development, that his mentor was writing operas even in his old age, and Cavalli started writing operas as well. As I say, um, the fact that this is a public opera house interestingly makes for big differences from the early operas that Monteverdi wrote, like Orfeo, the one that has survived. Orfeo has a large orchestra and a very varied orchestra, lots of continual. There's organs and harpsichords and chitarrone, theorbos, the long-necked lutes, and there are recorders and there are strings and there are early brass, cornetti and sackbuts. It's a gorgeous sound, but if it's a courtly situation that's sort of footing the bill, money or expense is perhaps not exactly no object, but it's not that much of an object. If the Duke wants an entertainment, and this is what he wants, besides some of these players were probably actually on salary, and they just got told what to do that week or month or a couple of months, what they had to prepare, it was very different from an opera house where, again, there's basically an impresario who has to come away with the, the receipts from ticket sales and balance his books by the end of the night. So we find in the middle of the 17th century uh, with these public opera houses, and by the way, I should say that once it caught on, it really caught on. There was in 1637 one theater presenting opera, but gradually there were three or four presenting uh, operas. I should say that when they did it, it was also a sign of their business plan, as is even still today. Venice was famous for its carnival. The time between Christmas and the beginning of Lent, however that falls each year, when you go and just have a great old time in various places, you dress up in costumes or you wear masks, and there are entertainments of all kinds, because once Lent starts, everything shuts down. So it was, a, it was a big tourist draw to go to Venice at carnival time. So of course, entertainers of all kinds thought, here's some easy pickings as well. It's, there's lots of tourists in town. There's lots of money being spent. Everyone's out for a good time in the dark of winter before Lent comes. And this is why the operas at first were only produced in Venice at carnival time. Um, but as I say, this meant that um, orchestras get reduced very quickly in Venetian opera, in Italian opera, in the middle of the 17th century. So what you're going to hear tonight is actually quite reflective of about the size of the group. We might have be a little shy. We probably should have a second harpsichord on stage. Um, but we only have two violins, and we've got two recorders. Not every opera would even have had the two recorders. 
a theorbo, we might have had two theorbos, but we didn't have anything like the orchestra from Orfeo. There were no cornettos and sackbuts that were on being paid to play in the opera theater because it was too expensive. Orfeo also has wonderful choruses, lots of them. Well, there's only two choruses in the opera tonight, and we're having our soloists sing them, which is probably what happened. And uh, because choruses are a luxury, which you can't always afford, so we have these reduction of forces, but it focuses things very much on the singers. And this was something that was already beginning to happen, as I say, that there were some very famous opera singers who could get paid a lot of money. Some of these famous singers were castrati. Uh, you probably know that this is young boys, like Cavalli, um, who have good voices, and they have an operation which means that it cuts the hormones which make a boy's voice change. But it doesn't mean that they become uh, castrated exactly. They certainly keep growing. So castrati were these singers who were male, they were men, they were big, because as they got into their 20s and 30s, they grew just like any man, so they had big lungs, which is very important for a singer, but if they, and boys usually, just like women's voices kind of come in high, medium, low, and men's voices come in high, medium, low, tenors, baritones, basses, for instance, there are boy sopranos, there are boys who sing more in the middle of their voice, mezzos, we might say, and there are boy altos. But if you have the operation, you stay in that range. So there were castra soprano castrati, and there were alto castrati. And these singers were some of the most famous, and this, this tradition lasted, at, in, its peak was really in the 18th century. And we know stories of Milani and, and, and all sorts of these um, uh, famous castrati from that period, but they, the, the tradition actually started in the 16th century and, and developed. And it was, you know, it's one of those funny things. So thank goodness it doesn't happen today. But it means that there's an issue when you want to perform, as we are going to tonight, these operas. In Elena, for instance, tonight, there are five big castrati, castrato roles. So these are all male figures in, in the story. They're all men, but they're singing up as sopranos or altos. So when you come to doing that today, it's, uh, it's, uh, you have to make a couple of choices. Sometimes, of course, you can find men who can sing that high, particularly if it's an alto range. It's quite close to what we call a countertenor. Now, a countertenor is not someone who's had an operation, as you know. It's a man singing in a developed falsetto. All men have a falsetto. Do, 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 Right? We can all do that. Every, every male here can do that. And some men just develop that so that it's a very powerful and controlled and beautiful sound. And they're countertenors. Uh, and just again, given the, the difference of everyone's body and voice, some men are, 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 would tend to be countertenors. That might be the strongest part of their voice. You certainly hear pop singers, you know, do, 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 you know and the Beach Boys, everybody sings in, in their falsetto. It's not a strange thing at all. So we, in fact, I asked one of the countertenors I like to work with to do one of the roles tonight and he wasn't available, so I'm afraid we struck out on that one. So for four of the roles, we have cast them as women. There's a couple of these roles were soprano castrati and a couple were altos. So I've hired two sopranos and two altos to do these roles. This is another tradition that you find in opera, which is women playing men. We call them pants rolls. And just to make it clear for you tonight, all the women who are singing male roles are wearing pants. <laughs> A little gender, gender stereotyping here, I'm sorry. But anyways, it's uh, just what we thought. You, you might want to, to get that signal. Then the other choice that you can make is to say, well, it's a man, and let's say it's a soprano role, but it's a man 
who's in the, in, the, in the show, I mean in the story, it has to be a man, well, why don't you give it to a tenor? And then you take all the music down an octave and you just ask the tenor to sing the very same notes just, and you, as you, you, I think you know enough that soprano is sort of the top of, this fe- of, of a woman's roles range and tenor, it's a high male r- range. So it's quite doable, you just don't have to change the music at all, it just goes down an octave. And that's what we're doing for one of the roles, and that's Kevin Skelton, who is going to play the part of Menelaus, who is one of the main characters in the opera tonight. The reason that, I've dis- that we decided to do it this way is also because, well, I should just go back one, one step. Helen of Troy, you've all heard of Helen of Troy, and probably the Trojan War. She's the woman who was reputed to be the most beautiful woman in the world at her time. She was from Sparta, part of the Greek peninsula. The Spartan women were famous for being fit and strong, and they loved to exercise. Um, There are famous pictures of of young Spartan women by the Romantics and so on. Um, She eventually marries another Spartan prince named Menelaus. They get married, but then along comes this prince of Troy, this Trojan prince, and Troy is a long way away by those standards. It's at the eastern end of the Mediterranean. And as you know, for a long time people thought Troy was completely mythological, but we have discovered, no, there was a, there was a city. We found ruins of Troy. It's a real place. It was a real place. But it wasn't part of the Greek Empire. It was kind of what the Greeks would have called these people were barbarians because they weren't Greek. Anyone who wasn't Greek was a barbarian. So uh, they, they came from that part of the world and sort of Anatolia and so on. Anyways, Helen, depends which of the Greek myths you want to believe. Some of them say that she was abducted by Paris, the Trojan prince. Others say, no, she went rather willingly with Paris and left her husband. Anyways, Menelaus is upset. A bunch of the other Greek princes have all said, if anything ever happens to Helen, and being so beautiful, there's no question but that something might happen, we'll all come to your rescue. So, of course, the Greeks, Agamemnon, and all of these people put together all sorts of ships. They sail down towards the end of the Mediterranean, and they attack Troy, and the war goes on for 10 years until the Trojan horse idea, and then some of the Greeks take another 10 years to get home, like Ulysses. That's the famous part of the story of Helen. None of that is going to be on stage tonight. What we're going to see tonight is early in her life, and you'll meet Menelaus, and he's courting Helen. They're both young people from Sparta. He's fallen in love with her, and he decides that the best way to get close to Helen is to disguise himself as a woman who is an Amazon. And by the way, for the Greeks, the Amazon doesn't mean the Amazon River in South America. Uh, It was somewhere further east still in kind of Iran, Persia area, they talked about Amazons, and they were also very strong people, especially the Amazonian women. Anyways, Menelaus decides that he's going to disguise himself as an Amazonian woman who is a fitness coach, (laughs) particularly renowned for his, her ability in wrestling. (laughs) So, yes. You can see that this opera is a comedy. (laughs) It's got a lot of silly scenes, and indeed, uh, of course, he disguises himself as a a fitness coach and comes in and uh, Helen says, oh, that's interesting, let's wrestle. And he gets nervous because he's worried that something might happen, that he might betray his, his disguise as they're wrestling away. Anyways, it's full of sort of erotic suggestiveness and so on. But this was where, when, I, when we figured all of this out, we decided it's actually going to be better if we cast Menelaus as a man, because otherwise it's going to get too confusing if it was a, a woman in a pants roll who decides to dress up as a woman, but because basically she's a man, you know what I mean? So anyways, <laughs> cross-dressing, uh, which we, and gender bending, which we're all very concerned with these days, is nothing new compared to some of the things that go on here. And of course, the other thing is that um, 
as happens in Shakespeare all the time too, when you do get women dressing as men or men dressing as women, someone of the opposite sex falls in love with him. So when Menelaus is dressed as a woman, one of another characters falls in love with Menelaus, another man. Unfortunately, tonight that's Vicky, who's a woman, one of the one more. <laughs> One of our castrati pants rolls. So good luck keeping it all straight. <laughs> As I said, this is actually very typical of the plot lines of all these operas. And again, in a way, it goes back to this public opera house thing. One of the things that um, would have been the stiffest competition for ticket sales and for your disposable income if you want a night in a theater in carnival time Venice in the 17th century would have been troops of Commedia dell'arte, which was a fairly new theatrical form, very famous, of course, lots of slapstick humor and lots of serious stuff as well. We sometimes forget that. Commedia doesn't really mean just comedy. It's, it's, it's more like a theatrical uh, troupe. Anyways, they were around everywhere and they would have been the competition. So it's no wonder that opera at this time tends also to have these crazy plots. And there's another aspect of it from a musical and theatrical point of view, which is very lovely, I think, which is that it's the, the operas are full of great variety. There are some, various beautiful, some very serious, beautiful scenes. The plot is constructed so that you'll hear it tonight once in a while, just almost out of nowhere, someone gets to sing a beautiful lament, and it's it's a genuine lament. They have good reason at that moment to lament. And Cavalli can write some beautiful laments. And then all of a sudden there'll be a song which is a very silly song and a very comic song. Um, so again, you get the sense that if you're trying to fill the house, maybe it's a good idea to have, as it were, something for everybody and different kinds of, of music packed together. This was something that towards the end of the 17th century, there was almost a reform movement in opera. And they said this combination of highbrow and lowbrow, as it were, in the same evening, just doesn't work. And it's very inappropriate. And so you find towards the end of the 17th century and into the 18th century with what is called opera seria, a new form which by and large, like some of Handel's operas, for instance, Julius Caesar is maybe one of the best known ones of Handel's operas. There's very little comedy in Julius Caesar. It's a serious story. Now it has again lots of variety, but it, there's not this combination of, of high and lowbrow. The other thing which high and lowbrow in these operas often means is that the so-called highbrow are the heroes or the aristocrats and the lowbrows are the servants. And to have them appearing on stage together is even later on considered inappropriate. Um, but it's much more, I'm not an expert, but it makes me think much more of Shakespeare too, that combination of, you know, in King Lear, suddenly you'll have this silly music, or the scenes with the fool and so on, or in lots of, this, in lots of his pieces where there's this strange combination of tragedy and comedy almost together. In fact, the Italians had a word for this kind of piece, which was tragicomedia. They talk about tragicomedia. And I would say that the one you're, we're about to see is tilted towards the commedia side of things. There's more lighthearted stuff than, than anything else. Um, so this is, um, it, these are some of the issues that we face as we're uh, doing these things. Now, of course, we're not staging the piece either. We're just going to be doing it in concert. We've worked out a few little bits of business, as we say, for you to enjoy and make it a little clearer sometimes what's going on. We've opted this evening for the first time since we've done these to have surtitles so that you don't have a big booklet, which it really uh, needs to be, or as the Italians called it, the word for book in Italian is libro, and the little book is the libretto. So a libretto was the little book that you got when you went to the opera house. Um, and it would, it, it's just like today, it, it helps to have the words in front of you as you hear and listen to singers, even if they're singing the language, your, your native tongue. Um, the other thing I will say is that 
The reason Cavalli's, another reason why Cavalli's operas are not so well known today is because they were never published. That's not surprising. Very few operas in the 17th century were published. They were written out by hand. Sometimes we have materials from a production, and the reason we can tell that is it's often you can get a sense that it was hastily written, or there's things that have been crossed out. As you know, it takes quite a bit of extra time to write something out by hand. And so if you're going to write out a whole score, but then you want to change something, you probably don't have time before the opening to write the whole thing out again in a nice clean copy. You just cross it out and say, no, I, I want this here. And so that's something that we see in some of Cavalli's materials. Thankfully, towards the end of his life, he also undertook a project to write out nice clean copies of some of his operas. And some of, the pat some of his patrons collected these fair copies, as we often call them. And there's a wonderful collection in one of the libraries in Venice that was assembled by one of the aristocratic families there named the, called the Contarini. And in the Contarini library, there are these beautiful editions or handwritten copies of a number of Cavalli's operas, including Elena. If we'd wanted to do this 15 or 20 years ago, we would have had to go to the library in Venice and look at the only copy of Elena which exists. Thankfully, today, it's been digitized. And you can go to Internet Culturale and do the search on it and put in Cavalli Elena, and then up comes the, just someone's gone through every page of the manuscript, taken a picture, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, and you do that, and you can scroll through, and you can see the original. So we availed ourselves of that. We didn't actually make the full edition ourselves. We've done that with Yamori, but in this case, there was also a, a, um, an edition online that a, a student had made at one point. But it was a very reliable, I uh, could compare it to the, to the original. And so that's, um, but this is, and Cavalli has not enjoyed, I'm afraid, what we call a complete works edition. A lots of composers for many, many years have had people say, we must have all of Bach's music in one place. We're going to make a complete, all of his keyboard music, all of his cantatas, everything that he ever wrote, we're going to put them all in a series of volumes. And we're going to get the most reliable thing. And a lot. It, it takes a great deal of scholarship to make a complete works edition. Cavalli has never enjoyed that privilege, I'm afraid. And again, it's partly because in the, in the case of materials that only come from productions, it's a lot of work to say, what did he really intend? Because this looks scratched out, but then there's another, there's a violin part here that doesn't match this, and the words in the libretto don't match the words in the music, so which do we trust, etc., etc. And of course, it takes time, it takes money, and Cavalli, for better or for worse, just hasn't been on the top of academic institutions' lists. There's one being undertaken now, thank goodness. So we're gradually getting uh, a work, the complete works of Cavalli. In the meantime, we're, we have great fun with producing it even in concert for you, so you can hear the, the wonderful music. Anyways, I see that it's 7.30, and therefore time for us to call an end. Um, so thank you very much again, and enjoy the evening. <laughs>